Why does helium make your voice sound funny? We've all been to a birthday party when, as the party winds down, one of your buddies grabs a balloon, tears open the stem, and takes a deep breath of helium right before he utters a few stupid Steve phrases the to the endless ball. joy of all onlookers within earshot of the demonstration. It never gets old. But have you ever wondered why the helium actually makes your voice sound funny? I had personally heard various explanations ranging from the helium makes your vocal cords vibrate faster to the sound travels faster in the helium which changes the frequency of your voice coming from your mouth. My boy Stevie actually looked at this very question for his 2012 science fair project and I'm going to let him tell you what he found in a moment. But first, let's look at how each of us actually produces and perceives sound. Sound itself is an alternating pressure wave caused by the mechanical vibration of an object. For example, this speaker consists of a cone diaphragm connected to a voice coil at the apex of the cone. The coil, or electromagnet, is situated just in front of a strong fixed magnet. A fluctuating current at the contacts generates a magnetic field in the coil that varies in strength and direction. The fixed magnet alternately pushes and pulls on the voice coil and thereby moves the cone and diaphragm back and forth in a vibrating motion generating a sound wave. This wave propagates away from the speaker, through the air, and eventually reaches the canal of our ears. At the back side of the canal, the sound wave comes in contact with a fibrous membrane, the eardrum or tympanic membrane. The alternating pressure wave vibrates the eardrum and this vibratory motion is transmitted and mechanically amplified through three small bones or ossicles in the middle ear, the malleus or hammer, incus or anvil, and finally the stirrup. The stirrup then vibrates the oval window, another fibrous membrane on the vestibule of the cochlea, and specialized cells inside the fluid-filled cochlea convert these vibrations into electrical signals that are transmitted through the eighth cranial nerve to the brain where the information is processed into the sounds we hear around us. Animals, including humans, produce sound with a flowing current of air and a reed-like flap of tissue. Air is brought into the lungs as we inhale. When we exhale, the air is pushed out of the alveoli, into the bronchioles, through the main left and right bronchi, and up through the trachea. At the very top of the trachea is the larynx or voice box. While the speaker produces sounds with electromechanical vibrations, the larynx accomplishes this task with two thin membranes of tissue called the vocal cords. While breathing quietly, the vocal cords are retracted out of the air current flow and no sound is produced. When we get ready to talk or sing, we take a deep breath and slowly exhale. At the same time, muscles in the larynx pull the vocal cords into the air current flow and like a reed on a wind instrument, the cords begin to vibrate and produce a sound wave. The frequency of that sound wave can be altered by changing the tension on the cords themselves. Shorter, fatter cords will produce a slow vibration or low frequency, but when the laryngeal muscles stretch the cords, they vibrate faster, producing a high pitch frequency. But this is just the beginning. What we perceive as a spoken word from a specific person requires some manipulation of these basic sound waves. The images I'm about to show you are derived from a three-dimensional CT data set. The first image is an oblique coronal slice through the airway showing the location of sound production or the vocal cords, the epiglottis which protects the airway when we eat or drink, as well as the air cavities of the mouth and nose termed the oro and nasopharynx respectively. We can look at the same area from the side with a sagittal slice through the airway, again showing the vocal cords, epiglottis, oropharynx, and nasopharynx. Now let's take a series of coronal slices through the facial bones to show you the paranasal sinuses. The paranasal sinuses are a collection of air-filled structures in our facial bones that surround the airways of the mouth and nose. Starting from the front, we have the frontal sinuses. 
Moving farther backwards, we have the ethmoid air cells. Now we see some more ethmoid air cells as well as the maxillary sinuses. And finally, at the back of the nasopharynx are the sphenoid sinuses. The sound of our individual voices is determined by multiple factors including the length of the vocal cords, the size and shape of the oral and nasopharynx, and the size and distribution of the paranasal sinuses, each of which has a characteristic set of resonant frequencies based on their size and configuration. All of these spaces, or small echo chambers, determine the tone quality or timbre of our voice and is the reason you can instantly recognize your Uncle Bob when he calls you up to talk on the telephone. Finally, the fine intonations and accents that make up the sounds we recognize as speech are produced by altering the configuration of the oral cavity as we open and close the jaw, as well as the position of the tongue in the mouth. Now let's get back to Stevie and hear what he found with his helium experiment. Thanks, Dad. Before conducting my experiment on why helium makes your voice sound funny, I did a little research on sound generation and propagation. Sound is produced by an alternating pushing or compression and pulling or rarefaction of the molecules of air around us. As such, sound, unlike light, will not travel through a vacuum. As the diaphragm of the speaker moves forward, molecules of nitrogen, oxygen, CO2, and others are pushed forward, bumping into adjacent molecules and propagating that pulse forward. As the diaphragm moves back, the molecules are pushed back toward the speaker and again tug on the adjacent molecules on down the line. The speed of propagation of these pressure waves is different for different solids and gases. In general, sound travels significantly faster through solids than air. At standard temperature and pressure, the speed of sound propagation of air is about 345 meters per second, while it's almost 20 times faster in granite at 6,000 meters per second. This may be justification for the legend that American Indians would put their ear to the ground and listen for the arrival of stampeding buffalo. While not as dramatic as air and solids, the speed of sound is measurably different for different gases as well. Again, at standard temperature and pressure, the propagation of sound through air is about 345 meters per second, 267 meters per second for CO2, 319 meters per second for argon, and 1,007 meters per second for helium. With this information, we assumed that as sound passed through the different gases, the change in speed would somehow change the frequency of the sound wave and give the characteristic high-pitched tone to the voice when you spoke after inhaling helium. For the experiment, we constructed a PVC tube measuring around 1.6 meters in length. At one end, we placed a simple speaker sealed to the end cap with epoxy and plumber's putty. At the other end, we took a microphone and sealed it to the end cap in similar fashion. The schematic shows how the components of the setup were connected. The details of the setup aren't really relevant to this presentation, but I do want to point out a few key features. A standard iPad 3 using a freeware application was used to generate a constant 500Hz sound wave, which was played through the speaker to the left. Note the multiple fill and drain plugs along the length of the tube that were used to instill the different gases. A computer was used to record both the sound, source, and received audio signals. The first run was performed with room air. As expected, the source signal was 500 Hz and the received signal was also 500 Hz. The estimated speed of the wave through the tube was calculated at 340 meters per second, very close to what was predicted. We then filled the gas chamber with helium and repeated the run. Again, the source signal was recorded at 500 Hz. However, much to our surprise, the received signal was also 500 Hz. The only difference was the fact that it took much less time for a sound wave to travel from the speaker to the microphone with a calculated speed of 970 meters per second. Two additional series were performed with CO2 and argon. Again, the received signal remained constant at 500 Hz with absolutely no frequency shift. The calculated speeds were respectively 265 meters per second and 320 meters per second. Since we didn't see our expected frequency shift, we postulated that the change may be due to the transition from one gas to another since we are constantly exhaling the helium as we speak. To this end, we again filled the chamber with helium, then took the speaker off the far end so the sound wave could transition from helium to room air. 
Results were recorded as before. Again, the receive signal showed no frequency shift but remained at 500 Hz. However, we did notice a gradual and transient amplification of the sound, both audibly and on the graph, with a peak amplification at around 10 seconds. Listen as we play back the receive signal. A similar result was seen when we filled the tube with CO2, but the process occurred over a longer time frame with a peak amplification at around 50 seconds. Thanks, Stevie. The results were a little baffling at first, but it all came together once we came across this simple little formula called the wave equation, which states that the velocity of a sound wave is equal to its wavelength times its frequency. In each of our results, the frequency stayed exactly the same at 500 Hz, and we know the velocity of the sound wave changed from gas to gas. So, solving for the constant variable frequency, which was always 500 Hz in Stevie's experiment, is equal to the velocity divided by the wavelength. From this formula, we can see to keep the frequency constant as the velocity increases, the wavelength has to increase proportionally, and we'll show you why this makes sense graphically. These two identical tubes are filled with room air at the top and helium on the bottom. For demonstration purposes, we're going to look at one cycle of our 500 Hz frequency. We know from Stevie's experiment that any constant frequency sound put into the front of the tubes will be heard and recorded as the same frequency at the other end. However, the sound wave travels almost three times as fast in the helium-filled tube. Since frequency is equal to cycles per second, to maintain the same frequency in both tubes, the wavelength in the helium has to increase so both waves start and end at the same time, just as the wave equation would predict. In the experiment where the helium was vented out the far end, as the helium escapes the tube, the sound wave slows and the wavelength shortens until we get to a point where the 500 Hz frequency perfectly fits into the length of the tube. This is the point of resonance where the entire tube vibrates with the input frequency and subsequently amplifies the sound. Applying these principles to speech and the airway, in room air, the sound generated from the vocal cords in the voice box has a wide range of frequencies, harmonics and subharmonics, each of which can either be suppressed or amplified based on the resonant characteristics of the oral and nasopharynx. In addition, the pattern of unique air cells in the paranasal sinuses will resonate at certain frequencies, providing an acoustic fingerprint for each and every one of us. Again, this is referred to as the tone quality or timbre of the voice and is the reason we can recognize each other by the sound of our voices alone. When we introduce helium into the airway, the speed of sound increases with a proportional increase in wavelength. This change in the wavelength alters the resonant characteristics of the airway and paranasal sinuses, especially suppressing the lower frequencies that already start off with a longer wavelength and would be less likely to fit perfectly into the small air cells surrounding the nose and mouth. So Stevie, sum it up for us and give us the bottom line. Helium changes the tone quality or timbre of your voice by increasing the speed and wavelength of sound which changes the resonant characteristics of the airway.